It is my desire, if the Lord wills, over the next several weeks, I'm not exactly sure how many weeks this will involve. It will involve several of them. I would like to spend some time taking you through a particular confession. It will be the London or the Second London Baptist Confession. It is sometimes referred to as the London Baptist Confession of 1689. And I want to spend some time looking at each one of the articles of that particular confession. However, before we do that, I want to take some time, and we're really not going to get into that confession very much this evening at all. I will read a few statements from it, and then whenever we get into the confession itself, we'll put them on the overhead. You'll be able to see them and work through them. The 1689 Confession is readily available at multiple places online. If you want to go out and, and read through it, um, we'll be, as I mentioned, going through each of the tenets of that. But before, again, we do, I think it is necessary that we make something very clear from the very beginning. At different periods of time, God's people, his church, have found it necessary to lay out in a quick and easy format statements to re related to what they believe concerning Scripture and the subjects in Scripture. That in and of itself is a good thing, a functional thing, so that we are able to articulate to one another and to others in a very condensed form what we believe. You may not necessarily be doing that overtly or obviously to your own mind, but you do that even as an individual at different times. For instance, all of us in here would say to someone we are witnessing to, if they asked us what is our belief about God with reference to his persons, and we would summarize that by saying, well, we believe in the Trinity. Now, the Trinity is not a word. The word itself is not found in the New Testament any place, but it is a word that is used to condense what we believe about God. And we define that as God um, in one in nature, and three in persons. And even that definition is a condensed definition. So we, we use that as a functional means. Now there's a danger in these kinds of things. There's a danger in confessions. There is a danger in just using the word Trinity. And one of the dangers with, for instance, the word Trinity is we don't have any idea what it means. I've talked to Christians that profess Christianity and say, I believe in the Trinity. Well, give me that definition. And they have no idea what it means. And they can't take you to the Bible and show you specifically what it means. That's a danger. Because their hope and their understanding isn't placed in God's Word. It's placed in some term, a term that in some instances they cannot even define. That's dangerous. Because in essence, what has happened is they have allowed a term to displace the living Word of God in their lives. Now, that can happen with various confessions, and it does. For instance, the confession often becomes the rule or the canon by which individuals will live by, and they follow the confession but have no idea of the substance upon which it rests. So, what I want us to do this evening, before we even get into this study of this confession, is to understand that God, whenever he conveyed his written word to his people, he did just that. He conveyed it to his people. It is to you. It is to me. And God expects us to study it, to learn it, 
to know it, to understand it, and not displace it with a confession, a word, or anything else. Those confessions or that word, whatever they may be, or whatever it may be, are simply abbreviated versions of it for the sake of conveying quickly what our positions as a church or an organization, or if a person's involved in a denomination, what that may be. It's not the rule. It's not the authority for the Christian life. The denomination can hold it as somewhat of a, an authority for its organizational points or principles, but ultimately it has no authority as compared to the Word of God. So what I want to do is I just want to take you through a few texts in Scripture. There are a multitude of verses that we could look at. And I've actually written down, as I've gone through, especially through the New Testament, a multitude of them that we're going to look at. But I'm just going to take you for a moment to some of them that address the fact that God's Word has come to God's people, to His people, of which if you're a believer, you are a people of God, a child of God, and His Word is to you directly. It's to me directly. I'm going to start by going to Deuteronomy, and I'm going to go there to the sixth chapter. Now, whenever we come to Deuteronomy, we're coming to the second law, and what that means is it's the second time Moses gave the law, the Ten Commandments, if you will, uh, to the people of Israel. He gave it first in Exodus 20, now here in Deuteronomy chapter 5. But I'm going to ask you to turn to Deuteronomy 6 with me. Here the Word of God comes to the children of Israel. Deuteronomy 6, 1. These are those individuals, you remember, who are going in to possess the promised land. Moses writes, and he says, Now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me, and notice this, to teach you. This is Moses writing to the people of God, that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it, so that you and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God to keep his statutes. Notice this, so that you and your children your descendants will fear God and keep his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life and that your days may be prolonged. O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it, that it may be well with you, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Now notice verse 6. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. Now notice this. Moses says, I'm teaching you. You are to teach them diligently, in verse 7, to your sons, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. What's important here? is the fact that God's Word ultimately is coming to the individuals in the ch- of the children of Israel. It's coming to them. I'm going to ask you to skip all the way into the New Testament with me. Again, there are several verses in the Old Testament we could see, but for the sake of time, we're going to jump right into the New And notice that, as we do, the majority of the books in this New Testament are written directly to God's, all of them to God's people, 
but generally to the church, to the saints, to the called, to the individuals. There are some books, for instance, First and Second Timothy and Titus, that are written to specific individuals. Those individuals obviously are believers. But even in them, there are exhortations to all of God's people. So ultimately, while some of the books are addressed specifically to an individual, they all pertain to God's people. Look at Romans with me, chapter 1. Most of this you can see right in the very first chapter, Romans chapter 1, and there to verse 5. Through whom, referring to Christ, we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is saying, I'm writing this to those saints who are in Rome. That's important. It didn't go to a pope. It didn't go to a specific person over all the church who was responsible for communicating it to the church, it went specifically to the saints. Now later, whenever we go to the book of Revelation, we'll see that the letters to the seven churches were written to uh, those seven churches, and that letter was given to the elder, and the elder was responsible for communicating it to the church. But the point or the principle was the same. The Word of God came to the people of God. They have direct access to it. There is only one mediator between God and man, isn't there? That's Christ. No one else. And we can go directly to Christ's Word. Move from here to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Actually, you're in Romans. Let's go over to chapter 15, verse 4. For whatever was written in earlier times is written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. All of God's people, God's Word was addressed to them for their instructions so that they might have hope. So that they might have hope. Move from here to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1, there to verse 2. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call on the name of, the Lord, name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Notice again, it's written to, those, to the church at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus. Again, to God's people. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. To the church, in verse 1, of God which is at Corinth with all the saints who throughout Acacia, who are throughout Acacia. Again, to the saints. To the saints. From here to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, and there to verse 3, grace to you, and, or excuse me, verse 2, to the churches of Galatia. To the churches of Galatia. So all of those churches, they would have received this letter, one church, and then they would pass it on to the next. From here, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Just as he chose, excuse me, um, chapter 1 and verse 1, excuse me, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. To the saints, to those who are Christians, 
Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons. Now, that's a powerful statement, isn't it? Because it's not saying, listen, this is something for the overseers, which are the elders or the bishops, one and the same, and they are the only ones to receive it. This is to all the saints, including them, right? Everyone gets it. It's not one single person, but it's all of them. All who are saints, all who are believers. Look over to Colossians chapter 1, verse 2. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae. Again, to all the believers. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. Take a look at chapter 2 while you're here. And verse 13. Referring to his preaching of the truth, notice what Paul said. For this reason we also, 1 Thessalonians 2.13, constantly thank God that when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God which also performs its work in you who believe. There is the sanctifying work of the word that's in view there, and they all received it. Those who are the saints at Thessalonica. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Verse 1. To the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul wrote to Timothy, didn't he? He makes it clear this was a personal letter from the apostle to Timothy. And he says to Timothy, my true child in the faith, chapter 1, verse 2. Look over to chapter 3, though. In chapter 3, he says, but in case I am delayed, I write, so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. And then notice this, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. All of God's people have this responsibility insofar as being the, the pillar and support of the truth, meaning you reflect God's truth in your life. It's stapled, nailed, tacked, attached to you. Second Timothy, again, chapter 1, verse 2, he says, to Timothy. But at the same time, you remember, as he wrote to Timothy, he said that Timothy is to be diligent to present himself, verse 15 of chapter 2, approved to God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Notice what he said in chapter 3, verse 16. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Then notice this. So that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. It applies to all the people of God. It's ultimately to all of God's people may have been originally addressed to an individual, such as here in the case of Timothy, but ultimately God had all of his people in view. Move from here to Titus chapter 1, Titus 1, 4, to Titus, my true child in the common faith. Um, Philemon's another epistle written directly to an individual. So is Second John, and so is um, Third John. Second John would um, uh, be to the uh, a church, most likely. Um, 
as far as uh, some are concerned. But the main thing is, ultimately, it all comes to individuals. It's ultimately to God's individual people. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. Actually, it's chapter 13, verse 22. But I urge you, brethren, bear with this word of exhortation. For I've written to you briefly. It's written here to the brethren in Christ. In James, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, these would be Jewish believers, part of the di diaspora, but again, to believers. Um, First Peter chapter one, to aliens. First Peter chapter one, verse one, to those who reside as aliens. That is those who are in the world, but not of the world, to believers. In Second Peter chapter one. He wrote Second Peter chapter 1, verse 1, he says, to all of those who have a like faith. Ultimately then, to all Christians. Look with me at Jude, verse 1. Jude, a bondservant of Christ and brother of James, to those who are the called, beloved of God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. It's to all the saints, to all Christians, to all believers. It applies to us individually. Sure, collectively is the church of God, but it comes to an individual level. Look to the book of Revelation with me. Verse 1 of chapter 1. <clears throat> The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bond servants, that is, his slaves, that is, the Christian or Christians, the things which must soon take place. And he sit and communicated it by his angels, so it came from the Father to the Son to the bond servants, and it comes to us through um, an angel that communicated it to John by his angel to his bond servant John. So there was a messenger, and you can see that as you read through the book, that communicates to John, and John communicates it to us. Look to chapter 1, verse 11. Jesus himself speaking to John, write in a book what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and Smyrna and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And then you know chapters 2 and 3 address specific characteristics of each one of those historical churches. But the application of it is to all of God's people. Very important for us to understand. One of the reasons it's important is because it is God's Word, and our lives are, as individuals, to be built on that Word aren't they? Look to the book of Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, as Jesus ends that sermon. You remember his words at the end of the chapter, Matthew 7 and verse 24. Remember the foundations? Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them, may be compared to a wise man, right? We have the individual responsibility as those who are believers. All people do, but very specifically us because God has given His, His Holy Spirit to understand His words. It is the foundation of your life as a Christian. It's the foundation of my life as a Christian. Back up in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4, Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? 
every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Not out of the mouth of the Pope, not out of the mouth of the preacher, but out of the mouth of God. His word to his people. His word to his people. John 8, 31. We're familiar with that text, verse 31 and 32. Jesus was speaking to those Jews who had believed in him. And he said to them, if you continue in my word, then are you truly disciples of mine? You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. How about that very familiar text we've been looking at in John chapter 10, multiple times over, chapter 10, verse 27. My sheep, what? Hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. And when someone says, I follow Jesus, they're not following him unless they know what he has said. It's one thing to say, I'm following Jesus, but it's an altogether different thing to say, here's what he said, and here's what I'm doing. There's not in Scripture a disconnect between God's people and his word, and his word. They are being sanctified by that word. John 17, 17, right? Look over there as you're in John, verse 17. Sanctify them in the truth, Jesus said. Your word is truth. You remember we just looked at verse 14 um, recently, and there Jesus said, as he's praying to the Father, I have given them your word, right? And the world has hated them. I've given them your word. What a precious possession the church of God has as it possesses God's word. Now, I've taken and I want to share with you a few quotes from the Second London Baptist Confession uh, of 1689 so that you can see in this that it upholds this very principle. This is from the first chapter which deals with the holy commands of God, the holy word of God. And I've taken from it, there are several things I could have brought in here, but uh, I didn't want it to be long or you to lose track with it, but to demonstrate that in this confession, it's attempting to hold up this principle that God's word has come to God's people. And it's not to be locked away in a vault someplace only for certain elite individuals to possess and then communicate to the people what they want them to hear. Tenet number eight of the first chapter says, The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. The, and listen to this closely. The native language of the ancient people of God. What's important about that? Did God speak to those Hebrews in Swahili? No. He put it in their language, didn't he? He put it in their language. It's, well, the New Testament was written in Greek, which at the time it was written was most widely known to the nations. The gospel in the New Testament would eventually be going to the Gentiles, wouldn't it? He put it in their language, didn't he? As a matter of fact, even the Old Testament in the Septuagint by this time uh, had been copied over into the Greek language because even the Jews were speaking primarily the Greek. You remember after they had been in the uh, Babylonian captivity for a period of time, those young people that were born during that captive period of time grew up not really understanding their own language. So whenever the Word of God was read, people had to go and explain it to them in their tongue. Listen to this as this statement goes on. These testaments were inspired directly by God and by His, his unique care and providence 
were kept pure down through the ages. They are therefore true and authoritative so that in all religious controversies, the church must make their ultimate appeal to them. Our ultimate appeal is to the Word of God. It's the canon. It's the standard. Now listen to this. All God's people have a right to and a claim on the Scriptures and are commanded in the fear of God to read and search them. Not all of God's people know these original languages, the Hebrew or the Greek. So the scriptures are to be translated into the common language of every nation to which they come. That's so that everyone in that nation can get the word in their language, right? That's why individuals gave their lives so you and I could have this English copy as we know it right now. It's not the exact English copy that was communicated to them. It's now in our English language. Nevertheless, it was translated so that the Word, God's Word, could come to every person. To every person. In this way, the Word of God may dwell richly in all so that they may worship Him in an acceptable manner and through patience and comfort of the Scriptures may have hope. Number nine, the infallible rule for interpreting Scripture is the Scripture itself. Now, this particular tenet is addressing the fact that Scripture interprets Scripture. But that's important for even us with regard to this subject. Because if we have a question, we can go to the Bible teachers, we can ask them, but ultimately you and I had the responsibility of comparing Scripture to Scripture to understand it, to get its meaning. Therefore, when there is a question about the true full meaning of any part of Scripture, and each passage has only one meaning, not many, a parenthetical note, it must be understood in the light of other passages that speak more clearly. Number 10, the supreme judge for deciding all religious controversies and for evaluating all decrees of councils, opinions of ancient writers, human teachings, and individual interpretations, and in whose judgment we are to rest is nothing but the Scripture delivered by the Spirit. In this Scripture, our faith finds its final word. So important for us. We praise the Lord for multiple different confessions, wherever, however they may exist, insofar as those confessions are true. But we don't put our faith in those confessions. They're not the rule. They're not the standard. They're not the canon. They are uh, summaries of what we believe, um, and they're, they have a place for conveying that succinctly, quickly, but they're not the rule. We have a statement of faith here at our church, but our faith doesn't rest on that statement of faith. It's a summarization of the things that we believe. I tell everyone that comes to our church, put us to the test to see whether or not we're standing fast and faithful to the Word of God. And most of the time that I tell them that, not always, but most of the time, I think that just seems to go right past them. And they don't really grasp that what I'm telling them is, you need to be looking for a church that's faithful in the Word, because that's the only thing that's going to sanctify your life. That's the only thing that's going to get you ready for heaven. That's the only thing that God is working through to transform His people into the image of Jesus Christ. And what a praise and a blessing that is. 
And we have it in these 66 books from Genesis to Revelation. Any final comments before we close this evening? And next week we will, Lord willing, uh, start into uh, that study. Any comments or questions? Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear God in heaven, thank you that you have spoken in your word to your people, that you've given us your Holy Spirit who indwells us, who opens our minds to understand its truth. I thank you and praise you that we have but one mediator, and that is Christ Jesus, our Lord. Father in heaven calls us to see on a regular basis the value of this, that Christ alone is our mediator, that your word alone is our authority. Thank you that we have, each of us, your people, access to it. And in access to it, we have through Christ access to truth regarding yourself that you've given us that comes from you. In Jesus' name, amen.